On this week's edition of New York Now, New York's top doctor says the state isn't to blame for the thousands of deaths at New York's nursing homes. Sometimes what happens is that a narrative gets perpetuated when it's not based on facts. We'll have details with Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio. Republicans in the state Senate have a new leader in State Senator Rob Ort. We'll ask him about his plans for the new role and the future of his party. It's been 100 years since women won the right to vote in the U.S. Join us for the first part of a series about women's suffrage. And advocates explain the value of paid sick leave in the context of COVID-19. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority will pass a legislation we'll pass a law prohibiting it, it, and we will take them to court challenging it. Get another stand. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. Thousands of people have died at nursing homes in New York from COVID-19, and this week the state published a report saying it wasn't at fault. Instead, the Department of Health said that nursing home staff and visitors brought the virus into those facilities early on. Here's Health Commissioner Howard Zucker. The data shows that the nursing home residents got COVID from the staff and presumably also from those who visited them. Unfortunately, we did not understand the disease early on. We did not realize how widespread it was within our community. And therefore, it was able to be introduced into a vulnerable population. Not everybody agrees with the state's report. With me now to talk about that and more is Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio. Karen, thanks for being here. Sure thing. So Karen, how are people reacting to this report? Are they buying it or is it some truth? What are we seeing? Well, you know, I think that there is a truth in what uh, Dr. Zucker was saying, that there's that staff could have brought in the virus. It does seem like it was here much earlier than people thought, and that it was here in mid-February to late February, and that perhaps visitors brought it in because visitors weren't banned until mid-March. But I don't know if that's the whole story on it, because what they didn't say is how many people left the nursing homes, were admitted to the hospital, and died in the, in the hospital. And without that number, you don't have a really good count of how many nursing home deaths there actually were. So it's hard to draw a conclusion from that. And you know, Cuomo's been criticized by the right-wing media, by the Republicans. He's very sensitive about this. So that's partly why they, they made a big deal of this report. But I guess I would just add that uh, Democrats are also skeptical, and it's very likely that the Democrats who lead the state Senate and Assembly are going to call hearings any day now, and they're going to look into this as well to just get a fuller picture of what happened. Because I think um, what Dr. Zucker is saying is you know, partially the truth, but I think people really need to dig down and know more because it's really, really important. And you would hope if we do have a second wave that, you know, you don't make any mistakes the second time around. So in other words, the case is not closed on this. We could see lawmakers come back, hold hearings. Would that result in legislation? Do we know what would come out of that, Karen? I mean, what, what actions can they take, if any? Well, I think it really depends what the conclusions are. And if it turns out that this March 25th directive was the wrong thing, then I guess they would hope that it wouldn't be uh, you know, implemented again in, this, in the, unfortunately, second round that we may get. So this week also, the governor had some non-news news. Schools may open in the fall. They may not open in the fall. He says they're going to make a decision by early August. What are they considering here, Karen? Because we know that the president is really pushing for schools to open. The governor is saying that they want to be a little bit more cautious. So what are we looking at in terms of a timeline and what factors are they considering? Well, I think they want to wait to the last possible moment to make a decision on schools, get as much information as they can. I mean, you know, we're learning new things about the virus, it seems, every day, if not every week. And uh, there's all kinds of possibilities. Schools could fully reopen. That sounds less and less likely, though. Um, partial reopening, where children go on alternative days, or the governor still hasn't ruled out that schools might not reopen at all. So the uncertainty really does continue for parents on this. We also had a, a really big decision from the Supreme Court this week uh, uh, relating to Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance. The Supreme Court saying that the president will have to hand over his tax returns to Cy Vance. Karen, what does this mean in the long term? I mean, I know that Cy Vance was looking at some criminal charges, maybe not relating to the president. We don't really know because it's a privileged investigation. But um, before I let you go, tell me what you've been hearing on that. 
Yeah, I think um, it's something that is going to be really in the long run because nobody's going to know before elections what Trump's taxes are. And many, many Democrats, Governor Andrew Cuomo, uh, State Attorney General Tish James tried to get at them. She was denied that by a, a federal judge. Um, I think a lot of Democrats would love to see Trump's taxes before November, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Right. As you mentioned, we've been looking at this for a long time. For the past couple of years, Democrats in the state legislature had a bill. It became a law that would allow Congress to get a hold of the president's tax returns if they requested them. Of course, that was held up in court. It's now on appeal, and we'll see where it goes. Uh, Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio, thanks so much for being here in New York Now this week. As always, we love having you. You're welcome. Republicans in the state Senate are among those calling for a third party investigation into the state's handling of nursing homes during COVID-19. And last month, they got a new leader. Senator Rob Ort will now lead the party in the chamber's minority. He joined me this week to talk about his plan to take back the majority in the state Senate and what Republicans would be doing if they were in power. Senator Rob Ort, the new leader of the Senate Republicans in the state Senate. Thanks for being on New York Now this week. Thanks for having me, Dan. Anytime. So the Republicans have been in the minority now for about two years since the 2018 elections. You have the chance this year to win back the majority. Tell me where you think Democrats have got it wrong in the last two years and where Republicans could have gotten it right. Well, I think, uh, you know, what you've seen over the last two years obviously has been a significant leftward, uh, we would say, radical shift to the left, particularly, you know, based around the politics of New York City whether it was uh, legislation that absolutely is gonna have a difficult impact on our farms, whether it's the, the bail reform laws, and now you're seeing uh, significant increases in, in violent crimes uh, happening both in the city, in Rochester, in Buffalo, across the state. You know, the uh, Democrats have continued to be much more focused on even people who are in prison, you know, people who have committed crimes and been convicted, they are much more concerned about that than they are about those who protect our cities, whether it's the NYPD, now you're hearing about defund the police, abolish police departments. Those bills, by the way, Dan, were around for a long time. Many of these laws existed in the Senate for many years, and it was the Republican majority that prevented them from coming into law. So I think that's a very clear contrast about the difference between Republicans being in charge of the Senate and Democrats, and we will take that to the voters uh, in, the, in the coming months. So what do you do if you're elected to the majority? Do you push for those uh, laws to be repealed in the near future? Um, you were talking about the, the bill, that, uh, the law that allows farm workers to unionize, and then obviously the bail reform law, which we've been talking about for the past year, I think. Do you push for a full repeal, or do you want to just see them modified? Well, certainly it's much harder to get a full repeal now, because even if we take the Senate, you know, the Assembly will most likely, uh, in all uh, cases, be run by uh, Democrats. And of course, the governor, you know, is a Democrat. So uh, it would be challenging for a full repeal. That is certainly what we would like to see. And I think a lot of voters would like to see. Um, but we will certainly push for much more significant changes that have been made. There's some Democrats uh, running in vulnerable seats or first term, uh, but we're going to do our best to make sure that the voters in those districts understand that those same senators voted for the initial bail reform changes, right? So regardless of what they want to do cosmetically, they all voted for those changes when they were first passed um, and voted for driver's licenses for illegal immigrants and, and a lot of other bills uh, that, again, might be popular in the boroughs or at least in some of them, but we do not believe uh, are popular in a lot of the Long Island or uh, suburbs and rural communities uh, north of New York City. A top priority for Republicans in the legislature has always been to lower the cost of living in New York, which you and I both know is extremely high, even in these rural areas of upstate New York. But there's also this challenge of the state's, you know, fiscal health right now. How do we lower the cost of living for everyday New Yorkers without major, making these major cuts to places like education and health care that people rely on? Well, I think that there's a number of, so you, you rightly point out, certainly education, health care, those always come up because they're the largest budgetary items every year. But they're probably the largest budgetary items in most states. If you were to go to all 50 states, I'm guessing that health care and education are the two biggest budget items in those states as well. And yet there are several states that have not only um, had lower cost of living than New York, but they've actually taken our residents uh, from New York, you know, whether it's, uh, and I think one of the ways you do that, you have to make it more beneficial for, for small businesses 
you know, individual uh, uh, sole proprietorships, but also for companies, medium, you know, uh, and larger businesses to do business here because those when those businesses leave, they take the jobs, people go with that, and that's why you see the cost go up because you have less people to pay for those services that you want to offer. And and what ends up happening when you do the cuts, your 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 the cuts are impacting lower income, they're impacting you know people who need those services, and at the same time, your wealthy folks, uh, you know, or middle middle class folks, those are the ones who are leaving. And if you have a shrinking middle class, that's going to be bad for any state, any county, any sort of community. And I think that's what we're faced at uh, here in New York State increasingly. So we're going to have to find ways to cut regulations, to cut business expenses and, and the uh, taxes uh, and expenses that businesses pay to help grow our private sector so that we can support the public sector that we have come uh, to know here in New York State. Let's turn to the coronavirus, which I think impacts this entire conversation from healthcare to the state's revenues to everything across the board. What do you think about the governor's response to the pandemic? He obviously gained national attention because New York had more cases than anyone else. He was doing daily briefings. How did you view his response to the disease? You know, it, it's a mixed bag, uh, you know, like, like a lot of, if we're being honest, right? So in the beginning, I thought, the, the daily briefings were actually helpful. They were helpful to me as a legislator, but I think they were helpful to a lot of folks because we were in very uncharted territory. Over time, there's been, it, it, they, they certainly were less helpful. They were obviously canceled because I think they had outlived their useful life. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of issues where we, uh, and I and a lot of other folks, I think take uh, issue or have criticized the governor. One, I think first and foremost, the, um, the immediate emergency justifying his broader emergency powers. To me, we have moved out of that phase. And I think we need to get back to where the legislature is a full-on partner in this response. You know, the other day the governor said that was a stupid idea. I, I don't know why he would say that. I think that that, um, that is all the more reason we need to come back. The fact that he thinks it's stupid, to me, thinks we need to be back. So I think that's an issue. The governor's nursing home response um, was uh, the, the order of March 25th absolutely was the wrong order. It was a disaster. I think what we have to get back to, we need an independent review, whether it's at the federal level or, again, the legislature. You know, the legislature has an investigatory committee. We have a health committee. We should be looking into that and coming to our own conclusions. And I think that's important that we do that and show that our government and function at the state level, even in the midst of uh, what is an unprecedented health crisis. Let's circle back to this year's elections, because obviously you have a lot of seats that are up for grabs in the state Senate that could handy the majority next year. How do you convince these middle of the road voters in swing districts that you're the party to go to over the Democrats? I, I know that you've brought up a lot of issues like bail reform. Uh, we talked about cost of living, obviously the response to the coronavirus, but how do you convince those voters that um, you would uh, chart a better path for New York than what is currently in place? I think the focus is we are uh, the common sense uh, alternative to what is an increasingly radical wing of the Democratic Party. Its only goal is to just constantly like out radicalize each other. Like, well, before it was this, now we got to move it further left. Um, and so I think that when you're talking to people in the suburbs, in rural communities, in cities, I think whether it's public safety, or, pup or prosperity, those are issues that I think connect with voters and that we will be focusing on uh, to try to win back seats. All right, new Senate Republican leader Rob Orr from North Tonawanda, thanks so much for joining us. Dan, thank you very much for having me. We have an extended version of that interview online. Switching gears, it was only 100 years ago that women won the right to vote in the U.S., but a lot has happened leading up to that moment, and a lot has happened since. Joining me is Masara Makati, who has the first story in a series about women in the vote this week. Masara, give us some context for what we'll hear in this story. Well, this story was going to travel through the past of the women's rights movement, pre-suffrage, post-suffrage, and the civil rights era. And what you're going to see is the fight for women's rights was desperately necessary. When you're talking about life for women in the 19th century and in the 20th century, historians say that they weren't just without rights, they were without personhood. They had no rights to their bodies, no rights to their children. They were the property of men their entire lives. 
One historian even said that women had no political, economic, or legal existence apart from the men and their lives. But obviously, the movement faced many obstacles from men and women alike. Women really had to play political ball games to push the movement forward. And there were a lot of women who opposed the movement themselves. And you'll also see, similar to the movement today for women's rights, that it was dogged by a lot of racism. Um, there were plenty of women who wanted to disassociate themselves from their black female allies and from the fight against racism, um, you know, with, with black women. So it you can see while this is a documentary that travels through history, you'll also be able to draw a lot of parallels to the fight for women's rights that still continues today. Really interesting stuff. Let's take a look. The battle to secure voting rights for women and their subsequent rise in political power is a great American story. It's a big national story with familiar and not so familiar names and places, and much of it played out right here in the Empire State. The struggle for women's voting rights in the U.S. was political and it was messy. Many men stood in the way, but so did many women. The New York State Association opposed to women's suffrage was one of the most active anti-suffrage organizations in the country, and many prominent New York women were among its members. The fight over a women's right to vote has its roots in the struggle for women's rights. Life in the 19th century for white women was one that tended to be very confined. There are ranges, but they tended to be very limited. Women were not allowed to make decisions for themselves. Their fathers made their decisions until they married. Their husbands made their decisions until he died. Is she without rights? Oh, it's way beyond that. She is without personhood. Once you marry, you become dead in the law. It's the legal code in common law. That means that you, of course, have no right to your body. A husband can beat his wife as long as he does not inflict permanent injury. Northern white women first begin to organize around the idea of women's rights in the 1840s. The Seneca Falls Convention of 1848 which many consider an important date in the movement for suffrage, was actually organized as a meeting on women's rights. It wasn't until the very end and after considerable debate that the convention voted to include a resolution on voting rights for women. There were black women in the movement. Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman were popular and active, but there were no black women invited or in attendance at the Seneca Falls Convention. I want to tell a story about Harriet Tubman that I think really illustrates what happens during this early period. Well, one time she was traveling with a white woman, Emily Howland, and they, so they traveled together, they get to the train station, and Emily goes off. She comes back in the morning and Harriet Tubman is sitting in the train station. And she said something about, well, where did you stay? She had no place to stay. She sat up on a bench in a train station all night long. When black women traveled, they would have to stay with someone. That shows you how complicated it was to think about just the logistics of travel. As the Civil War approached, another issue took center stage. The abolition of slavery was seen as a moral imperative by progressive Northern white women. The issue of voting rights for women was temporarily put on hold. And what they're doing is they're setting aside those goals in order to support the union, to support the federal government, and to support the abolition of slavery, which of course is one of the major, is, is the cause of the Civil War. Women's rights advocates, including many here in New York, supported the Civil War as a way to abolish slavery. As they organized and raised money for the union, their political influence grew. 
Now, the significance of this is that it's at a time when Abraham Lincoln is saying, this war is being fought to preserve the Union. And they're saying, no, no, we won't support it. And women are raising money that really is the backbone of the medical care of the uh, soldiers. And so they've got some money behind them as they're speaking to Lincoln. And the number of signatures they gather, they are a strong, powerful force in forcing Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. After the war, women suffragists who had worked on behalf of the Union felt they were owed the right to vote. Suffrage leaders closely monitored the legislation coming out of Washington after the Civil War. Progressive white suffragists celebrated the passage of the 13th Amendment and the end of slavery, but the suffragists objected to the 14th Amendment, which failed to extend equal protection to women, and to the 15th Amendment, which granted black men the vote, but excluded both black and white women. To suffragists like Susan B. Anthony, the proposed 14th and 15th Amendments were an affront. In response, the singularly focused Anthony aligned herself with Southern segregationists. The National American Woman Suffrage Association took this position. Their argument was, if you want to maintain white supremacy, if you want to maintain the supremacy of those born in the United States against immigrants, against African Americans, you want to support women's suffrage. They could have made a different alliance, but they chose to ally with Southern segregationists, with Southern racists, with Southern white supremacists. The 15th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified in 1870. Susan B. Anthony lost the battle. The repercussions of her choices are debated to this day. As I said at the start of this report, this is a messy political story. The next 50 years would see a fractured but consistent campaign to push the idea of suffrage forward. It was a long struggle. In 1917, New York voters, all men at the time, voted to amend the state constitution and grant women full suffrage. It was a cause for celebration, but there was still much work to be done. The ultimate prize, federal voting rights for women, was still only a dream. Join us next week for part two. And for more on the national movement for women's suffrage, you can stream American Experience, The Vote, at WMHT.org. Before we let you go, paid sick leave has become a major issue during COVID-19. New York even passed an emergency paid sick leave bill in March and followed it with a permanent law in April. Ryan Jones spoke with Blue Carriker from Citizen Action and Rosanna Cotabatris from the Northeast New York Coalition for Occupational Safety and Health. Blue, what effect do you think the coronavirus will have on the conversation about uh, sick leave and public health going forward? I think the clear and obvious um, lesson of a pandemic is people must have paid sick leave. They must be able to stay home when they're sick and they must be able to stay home and care for their family members when they're sick. So the question is, how do we then help businesses who um, maybe um, have, see that as a challenging thing? And that's a role of government. Government's role is to help us all be safe and healthy and to intervene on behalf of individuals or businesses to make that possible. And this is clearly a public health imperative. Rosanna, how will you and your organization make the argument for sick leave going forward? So we see paid sick time and other benefits as essential public health measures that will help to um, you know, improve the safety of the workforce. And it also makes sense because 
at this time when we're talking of pandemic, this is the only type of public health measure that we have that we can control for without having a vaccine. This is the one way that we can prevent people from getting sick. When people are able to stay home from work and their job is protected and they're able to still provide for their families because they're getting paid for that time off, then that would just help everyone. We'll have an extended version of that conversation online. That does it for this week. Thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well.